yeah okay so this is just recorded chris thanks for having uh thanks for coming on the podcast mate it's been a uh, pleasure to be here <laughs> it's been great to finally get you on thank you very much ever since that catch wrestling you ran uh with um with tony summers and matty evans back in college matty evans yeah all december 2016 yeah right it's so a good it's been, day <laughs> it was good up in the uh Fozo community center and uh yeah yeah my... it's a good Sorry, go it's on. a good venue. It's a good venue. We used to go there like many years ago. I used to go there and trim with Matty and Tony. And I think it was like 2010. Good, good times. Good ad sessions, as always. Chris, why don't we start? Uh, for those that may not be familiar with yourself or your own background and legit pro wrestling, do you mind doing a bit of a bio and an introduction? Yeah, no problem. Where would you like me to start? <laughs> you got a big TV, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start from the beginning? How did you... Um... The martial arts, yeah. Martial arts, yeah. Yeah, so it'll have been 1986, 85, 86 was when I first started kickboxing. It was uh, There was a kickboxing school in the estate where I lived. It was called Kyora Tigers. It was like full contact kickboxing above the waist. And it was... I didn't go much... I just go the odd time, but it was good. But looking back, it was a lot different to martial arts now. And, you know, our instructor, he went and got a silver silver in the WACOs, European Championships. And another guy there who, who became my coach many years later, he, he went and got the gold. But, like, they bring people in for sparring, and all, all those kids would be sat there, and they were, they were going to it, you know what I mean? Like, there was no mats or anything like that. People are getting roundhouse kicked and, like, blood splattering all over and all that. It was hardcore, you know what I mean? It was, uh, I think it probably was like that in the 80s with everything, wasn't it? But, uh, yeah, Stockton, the, the town where I grew up, it, it's got a good history for, for martial arts and whatnot. You know, we, we had the best judo club in the country for many years. Old Joe Glynn, who's still coaching now, I think he's 88 years old. You know, he's still coaching now. Uh, we always had, um, we were the only club we were the only town in sorry in the northeast had a freestyle wrestling club. They were always creating British champions, and I was lucky as I found my first like serious coach, Arjan Barry Norman, who was also coached in Stockton. So we had full contact karate there, which was actually a, an association from Coventry ECK, which was Deb Barrett and How, Howard Brown. So I was really lucky to to be in a town where there was a lot of uh, well, there was a lot of action. There was always places to train. And, um, yeah, that, that's it. I started off and I was about, I, I trained seriously, like from 1992 onwards. I've never stopped training. As I said, I was training with Arjan Barry in the ECKA, which is like contact karate. I love that. I was with him for like four years. I didn't always do grains as the grains were quite expensive, you know, and I'd be cutting grass, delivering papers, this, that and the other to get money. And then I, 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 everything would go on training, buying martial arts magazines and whatnot back in the day before um, before YouTube and things like that. But I remember there was mirrors, there was a mirrored room. So whenever whenever Barry's coaching, I'm looking at what all the, the higher belts are doing, the black belts and whatnot. Within two, three months, I'd say I had the full curriculum down. I'd go and I'd write notes. I had a friend who I'd coach, Neil. I'd, I'd coach this, this uh, kid the same age as me, Neil Robinson. And he was probably the first champion I ever coached. So from day one, I was coaching. I always liked to ask the knowledge on. And when he was young, he went into the army. When we left school, and he became a boxing champion in the army. So that was good. And we'd also got the amateur boxing club, which was a very, it was a tough, tough club. You know, amateur boxing, it's a tough sport, isn't it? But I got I got put up from the, the juniors, which like seniors in boxing then was 17 plus. I wasn't in the junior class for long. I got put in with the seniors and I get some good items. You know, I'd be like 14 and getting dropped by men, you know, much heavier. And that's just how it was. I wouldn't coach people like that now. No way. But looking back, it was it is what it is. You know, I didn't learn a lot of technique in there, but I learned my way around the ring. And I learned about hard training because like when it was the season, there'd be lots of sprints, lots of sparring, lots of pads. When it wasn't the season, you'd be doing lots of rounds on the heavy bag long runs, lifting weights and stuff. So we'd cycle the training and it was good. Everybody went to that boxing club. But the sad thing is when I look back, like not everybody, because there's one guy who's like done well, he's in the special forces and still to this day, there's another guy who's done really well with business. But the vast majority of people that went to that club, they've lived a bad life. You know, someone uh, took their own life who ended up doing really well for a while, turning pro. A, a vast majority being in and out of prison, addicted to heroin. We have a big heroin problem here in Teesside. Sometimes I wonder whether it's because of the place where we lived, why, why there's been so much like turmoil in people's lives or whether it's 
just all of the the head contact and stuff because you know there's a lot of studies now isn't there and you know, you're a medical professional yourself and just getting getting get, you know seeing white flashes and getting dropped off men four or five stone heavier it ain't good for you you know it really isn't it isn't that good for you what, it's, what, so it's, what yeah, it's one of them that? What regiment was that? What did you say his name was? Mark Robinson? Neil Robinson. Neil, Neil Robinson. went in the uh, the Light Dragoons he went in, I believe, because I, I trained another kid from there. Yeah, the other kid um, the other kid got thrown out and he was in the news of the world. They called them the Light Drug Goons because of, uh, they were taking ecstasy tablets, driving tanks on exercise, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, but that was nothing to do with him. This other kid stayed in for about 15 years. He did really well. So yeah. How, we, how did, how did this, uh, progression from that kind of martial arts how did you discover the grappling art? Cause you got yeah, well, yeah, we, we, we did a bit of grappling with, because I was doing Thai with Barry as well. He had a club up in Newcastle. Uh, I did a little bit of judo, but with the, with the grappling art, this is, the, this is a funny story. This would have been, this is in the book, by the way, this story. You're know, fucking lucky. Well, come on to me. <laughs> I'm going to come on to your book in a bit. Go on, yeah. And, um, yeah, this would have been, the, it was the summer of 2000, you know, in 1999, the back end of, Back into 1999, I'd, when I left school, I was I was still training, but I, I went kind of off the rails a little bit where I'm going out, I'm partying and whatnot. I'm still training, but not like how I was. I got heavily into I got heavily into weightlifting because I was really thin. So when I was boxing and doing stand up and whatnot, I was really thin. I couldn't get in the army because I was too skinny. I was too thin. I'm sat here now with like about 120 kilos as I say this. But yeah, I was super super thin. And so around about that time, I was 17, I got into a fight with somebody. My friend had died the night before. You know, my, I had a friend who died, so I was down. I'd been drinking, got into a fight with somebody. And as I'm walking out of this park, the Monkey Tree Park in Stockton, suddenly there's a Cortina flying at me. It's hit me. And I remember seeing a one magpie as I was in the park, funnily enough, and thinking one for sorrow. Next thing I come out and bang. Uh, obviously, it's dropped me. It's like a, 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 not like a car park, like a, it was like a dirt, you know, like it was leaning into the park. It was around the side of the, around the side of the shop. And so I get up and I walk around the corner where this shop is. Next thing, I just see a glint because it's a summer's night. I see a glint and there's a fella's got an axe, you know, and he's lifted it up. And I remember thinking, he's not going to hit me with that. I don't know why I thought that. I thought he's not going to, he, he did. I was wrong because there was a lot of people there, you know, you, you don't think that's going to happen. So it hit me down here. So anyway, obviously he's dropped me. And then he's came to he's came to hit me with it again. And somehow I've ended up getting two hands on it. And then I've ended up with it. I've ended up with it. So now I've got the axe. He's there. There's another there's a woman there, I think it was his sister. There's loads of people, but I was like, um, I was you, obviously it, it's different than even getting it with a shot, isn't it? And I remember I had a blue t-shirt on, it said Reebok in white. But it just looked like it was black and it was it was clinging to me. I was losing a lot of blood and I was like disorientated. And I remember thinking, I've got the axe now. But then somebody came from behind, snatched it out of me. That that was a sister out of my hand. Then another lad pulled up, a lad from an estate, Ragworth, a close estate, and he asked what had happened. There's people screaming. The man who owned the shops locked the people in the shop, obviously. You know, it's he's a big stocky fella, you know, and I was just a skinny kid, really. So this lad says, I won't let anybody join in. I won't let him use weapons, get stuck into him. So I did. So I, I was getting stuck into him. And I, I was punching the face of him, to be honest, but I had no power. I was like a skinny kid, but I was just hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. And I felt euphoric because obviously the amount of adrenaline that must have been going through my veins was like crazy. And then police come, ambulance come, and uh, yeah, I went, went off to the hospital. So I I didn't want, I didn't ever want to be over, overpowered and outstrength ever again. And I got staples in my head and whatnot. And a couple of weeks later, when the staples were out, I seen the man again. He, he was going past, you know, the type of place where we lived. I had to do something because it would have been, um, you know, you, you can't let people, you know, like make a cunt of you like that. So I threw a brick at his car. So bang, he comes flying up. And we had another fight. This time we're fighting. But I remember he was just too strong. There was a point where he had me. And he hit my head off a curb once. He went to get went to get it on again. And somehow I just like scurried up. And he was tired. He was tiring. Because at the beginning I was hitting him with shots. I could box. So I was just like picking him off, picking him off. But, you know, they have weight divisions for a reason, I believe. And he was a big, strong man. And I was, he was marked up. But it wasn't, I was doing nothing with him. But this time he's ran because he wants to put me back on the floor again. But I've managed, I didn't know any type of grappling, but I've sprawled back and I've got him in a guillotine. And then I'm choking, choking, and I could tell he was tired. And I took a chunk out of his, like out of here, I bit a chunk out of him, you know, then I ended up getting 
split up and what and whatnot. But I, I took a vow right then. Nobody's overpowering me ever again. Nobody's overpowering me. So I start seriously lifting weights, taking all types of supplements for horses, for bulls. I wasn't bothered. I was taking it. There was something that make me strong. I was taking it, and I got very, very strong. You know, within no time, within a couple of years, I was I was uh, pressing three and a half plates behind neck. I was doing five plate bench presses. And this this is uh, quite bad because I live in the area where I'd grown up and there was always bullying and we'd like get our house burgled, we even stole the front door, you know, we live in a bad area full of drugs and whatnot. And suddenly I was like, I don't know, six stone heavier or something like that, seven stone heavier. And I, I had a big chip on my shoulder and, and these people who I'd see, who would like slap me around when I was a kid, it, it, the, t- the tables changed and I'd be seeing people getting out of prison. I'd not seen them for years, I was just a little kid and then, and I'd been training all this time, keeping my head down, and then suddenly I was like, I was a lot heavier and whatnot. So to get back to this story about how I um, started grappling, you know, for a while I stopped drinking, not drinking on the head and whatnot, because I get I got into some scrapes with Dorman, and then a man who ran all the doors in the area, he wanted to meet me one day, so he arranged to meet him. I went down. He was like leaning against his R1 motorbike. He was a tough, tough fella. He ran all the doors. He was the man I spoke about earlier that won the gold at the Wackos. And he was waiting, but then he said, look, I know you've been causing tr- trouble, bloody blah, in these places. It might not have all been you, but I want all the doors in this town. Can you get me all of them? So I was like, yeah, no problem. So he let me train. He had like a lockup. He let me train there for free. And they were doing grappling, but I didn't have no interest in that. I thought, rolling about on the floor is not for me. It's not really a man's way to fight. He stand up and fight. And then I'd go around, I'd get in the security and whatnot. You know, I'd get in the security, I'd go around, I'd start fights with Dorman and whatnot. I just, I was in my element, I was just a young lad. And that, that's the type of life that I was living, which is a load of shit when I'm looking back now. You know, I live a much different life now, obviously. I've grown up, but I got myself right. I wasn't drinking, I took a vow, I want to box seriously. So I started training with a man called Maxie Smith, who was very, he was a disciplinarian, he was an ex uh, Royal Marine commando. He'd box for the, Commonwealth title professionally at light heavyweight cruiserweight didn't exist then but I'm guessing he would have been a cruiser he's a big tall man he taught me how to box his boxing style was really nice you know really nice like long jabs and all about head movement he was really really good it was about hitting and not getting hit I really started to enjoy myself but then Max he was concerned because he's thinking why is this kid training non-stop I don't think he has any uh, intent on competing he, he, t- he said to somebody but I really did no, he thought I was doing it just because he'd heard about I'd been getting into bits of scripts with Dorman and whatnot. But I was doing this to knock that on the head. But I didn't want to go and speed when I got told this. Well, Max, he doesn't want you going in because he thinks you're gonna, you're just gonna be fighting outside, blah blah blah. I didn't go and see him. So what did I do? I started, um, I started going drinking again and whatnot. So this is for a couple of months. I thought, nah, this is no good. I'm going to see Maxine. I'm gonna just be honest and say I really need something that's gonna give me focus and keep me away from this life. So I get in my car, I think, right, I'm going to see Maxi. I had a like, white track suit on, I remember back to the day, I had my training gear in the car. As I drive out the street, bang, I've crashed my car. So I crash my car, I'm like, no way. So I apologize to the lady, tell her I haven't got a driving license, I haven't got insurance, I haven't got nothing, but I'll pay for the car. She gives me her address, so I go around. How much will it cost? So I went and got when I paid the, the money, give, to give her husband a bag of money, I had fivers, tenors, and all this and that. You know, I didn't, it was a long time ago, he didn't have bank accounts or anything like that. So I was devastated. So, what do I do? I got out drinking. It was a Thursday night, because that's when Maxi was on the Tuesday and Thursday. So, I go out a Thursday night in Stockton. You're not going to get any sensible people out. Like, there's a, a row of pubs, nightclubs, and whatnot. And I'm in my training gear. So, I'm drinking in everyone, drinking everyone. I end up in a, a nightclub, which is called the Mal like a well-known nightclub. They used to have something called the Hitman and Her years ago, and that went there. It was like the, where everybody went. So I was drinking. When I come out of the nightclub, 2 a.m., you can imagine. I, I haven't drank, by the way. I haven't been drunk now for 21 years or something like that, and I'm very, very glad. When I walked out of the um, the nightclub, the, the morning air hit me, and I was like, I felt so, so drunk. So I, in Stockton, you walk around the corner, there's like pizza shops, rows and rows of pizza shops. It's a big, big nightlife. I walk around the corner and there's this man, he's like a Palestinian fella, looking, saying something. I can't quite remember what happened, but he comes forward. I've took a, a slap at him. Anyway, he scurried off. Next thing, there's another man comes around the corner. It looks like a, a villain off James Bond. He's got cauliflower ears and he's got traps up here and he's coming, <laughs> coming in my direction. So I threw a punch at him. Next thing, I'm, I'm up in the air. He's hit me with a double leg, but 
people, this is a funny thing because I've told this story many, many times, but for that split second while I was in the air, it was like uh, that eureka moment. I was like, wow, grappling does work. This works. And I was like, I was on top of the world. I was like, yes. Bang, I come crashing down. Then he doesn't know any striking at this point. So he's trying to like slap down. I'm trying to bite about his fingers and all that was scurrying about. It gets split up. And then someone says he's in that, he works in that pizza shop down the bottom. And he just came over from Afghanistan. He was working in the pizza shop. So I go around there, I kick the side entrance in. I don't know if it was him, I was fighting with somebody else. And the next thing, crack. I'm on the floor. The, the, they've all come round with long, like, um, broom shanks or whatever they were. And, like, they're all hitting down on me on the floor. So I'm like, shit. <laughs> so I'm fighting. Oh, yeah, and the taxi come and, like, park that way in. Anyway, I managed to somehow get up, get around the front. So I said, we'll, we'll, like, we'll fight tomorrow. And it wasn't tomorrow. It was a couple of, it wasn't the day after. It was a couple of, it was a couple of days after that. It bad hangover and everything the next day. And I thought, no way, I've been like through and thrown all over in front of like, because everyone, all the people are out on a Saturday and it's like a town where everyone's talking. And I thought, no way, I thought he's a wrestler. So I, I go and see the guy again who ran the security company. Okay, I need to learn grappling. So he taught me a sprawl. He taught me um, how to keep my hips back when I throw my shots. So it'll have been three. That was the Monday. That was the Thursday. It was the Monday night. We were into fight around the back of a gym called Natural Progression. With that part of the town, it's all like Asian people and whatnot. So the deal was I take two people and this fella takes two people. But I got there, oh man, talk about like uh, being outnumbered. It was, like we, it was like we were abroad. You know, there was just people, people, people everywhere. They had me waiting for a long, long time. In the end, so we ended up fighting again. You know, this time I didn't get took down. So I was very, very happy with, uh, with that. And I was addicted to... I was addicted to learning grappling. But what I didn't realize was when I'd been hit over the head many times, a few nights before, it started to bleed in my head. It started to bleed in my head. And then I went sparring again. Well, Marty had hard sparring. And I started to um, I started to see, like, it happened to me before after sparring, where I think I've got a migraine. But this was different. I was being sick. I was vomiting and whatnot. And also in between that little gap as well, I'd been out partying again. And I, I, I took a lot of pure cocaine. I've been just snorting it, you know, like Tony Montana type of behavior. Absolutely just living the life to the extreme. And back then as well, like I was sure that I was going to get killed. No, by the way, I was living my life and, and I wanted I wanted that to happen. Like, well, I would never kill myself, but I just wanted someone to put me out of my misery. So it was just like, it, I, I was just thinking this is what's going to happen. You know, very, very different now. But anyway, I end up in hospital. They send me back. I end up there again. But then they realize he's got a bleed in his head and it was the size of a tennis ball. I remember thinking I'm dying. It was people coming in this room to see me and it was like as if it was for the last time. You know, then my brother came in. He said, you're not going to die. You're going to fight it. And he reminded me of when he'd been shot and his friend had been shot. Now they fought it and all that. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm going to fight it. But until then, I think I was probably just happily thinking, ah, this is it. It's, it's time to go. But while being in this hospital, I, I got really ill when I was in hospital. I caught like uh, one of these um, staph, staphylococci infection, infections or something. And I remember I was there with my friend and uh, they, they lost me, you know. And in this time while they lost me, I thought it was a split second, but I come round and they've got all these things on me and the doctor's looking terrified when my eyes have opened again. But my friend's gone all the, like, gone quite a distance, got somebody else and came back. So I don't know how long I was out, but while I was out, I was in like a, I wasn't in pain anymore, and it was just like beautiful white, much better than white, a colour what I can't really, I don't really know what it is. And I, I was like, night when you're in an escalator and you're going up, but there was no escalator, and I was going up, 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 up. And my grandfather, I could see him, and I could see another lad that I knew that died, and they were like the engine, and I was about to go in, and I just, I just shot myself back. I just shot myself back, and then that's when I, I woke up, and all the doctors were there, and then that was... <laughs> that, that that was that was that that was 2000 so after my um my, my, my first grappling lesson where i get dropped in the sky I had another grappling lesson went back had the fight in another sparring session tough sparring session i had four grappling sessions but i'm laid there like i'm in pain and whatnot and i was bad for some time i had delayed concussion i was being sick for months and months afterwards i lost a lot of weight and they said it was really dangerous for me to get it in the head again and someone gave me a, a videotape a long time ago of Cho Kicks and Gracie 
And I realized that I could learn how to, I could learn how to fight without getting smashed too much. Cause he's beating all these guys and I realized he's not getting hit. And I thought, yeah, this is what I've, this is what I've got to do. And I, I'd like to say that then suddenly I just turned my back on everything, blah, blah, blah. But it, it was an up and down. It took me probably, I don't know, 10 years before I really, really sorted myself out. Like I quit the drinking and all that. But, um, you know, I started to train again in the year, two, in the year 2001 at some point. And then the guy, Marty, uh, who ran all the security and stuff, he got shot. He was on a life support machine. So he just started, tra we were training together for a couple of months because he was training to have a fight with somebody. And then that somebody ended up shooting him. And then he's on life support. So I go down and I was still not really in top health myself. I said, I'll come and stand on the door because people were trying to take the doors. And then I ended up there and I was only a young fella. And oh man, that was like, that was like the Wild West because he has all this lucrative empire to do with doors and whatnot. People are trying to take it. So then I end up, they had dormant within not not much time at all. Marty gets better, but he's still not like, you know, he's a shadow of his former self, really, because of what he's been through. He, he, man, he, he got shot at point blank range. And so then, yeah, I was a young fella looking after all of this. And so that was like, I, I sort of jumped out of the frying pan into the fire, so to speak. But in 2003, I went off to Brazil because I realized I started training in Doncaster 2002. I had a couple of like mixed rules fights where amateur MMA, then there was no head strikes. I thought, oh, this is all right. It's grappling. And I can throw a few tie kicks. And I went and won something called KSBO in Nottingham. I went and trained with Mauricio Gomez actually in 2002, April, and his son, Hodger Gracie, who was a brown belt at the time, who went out on to be like the greatest jiu-jitsu man of all time. This was in uh, Birmingham. Solio and Stevie B's gym and I was like what what's this and I remember this little fella called Arif little fella called Arif I goes with him in his garden put me in a armbar and nearly broke my arm I was like oh man I, thought, I love this and again then I thought I'm never gonna stop doing this I will never ever stop doing this and then once I found Gracie Bar Doncaster I was saying I want to go to Brazil I want to go to Brazil and I was thinking man, he can't go to Brazil he get murdered this like white belt and they were going out there and they were blue belts but back then a blue belt was like they were like a, a mysterious like they were like something I don't know like <laughs> there wasn't many of them there was something amazing oh, blue belts I'd travel like 180 miles around trip to train my blue belts then and then I'd be coaching people when I was a white belt. I went to Brazil for a couple of months, came back, and I was coaching people. But there's an old saying that in the land of the blind, that one-eyed man is king. And it was one of them. I knew more than I knew more than them. Unlike now, where everybody can access all this information, it wasn't like that. So, so you know, for a short time, I went out to Brazil for that first trip, and it was amazing because I could be myself again because I'd never been able. To, I didn't really know who I was. And, I loved being Chris from England, the white belt, in this gym where it was full of the best jiu-jitsu men on planet Earth. They were all there. All the top world champions were there. Like Nino Shembri, it would be Sakuraba in Pride, Carlos Lemos Jr., Gordo, Godinho, Hodger Gracie, Pedabano. Everybody was on this mat. And I was just Chris. You know, I just do my six, ten-minute rounds, get smashed, and I was so, so happy. But I felt a peace while I was there, like a happiness, but I didn't know what it was. And years later, I found this to be the Holy Spirit. And a lot of them men were, they were godly men, what was in there. And, you know, the people would be praying and stuff. And I didn't know about all that then. And I just think that something happened. And that was where I knew that uh, I really had to change. But it was many years. It was like 2010 before I finally gave up all that security world and whatnot up. And it was a battle. And then after then, it was a battle as well because how am I going to earn money? How am I going to provide my family? Blah, blah, blah. And I really felt like I was put to the test spiritually, physically, and mentally. But, uh, you know, I didn't quit. I kept on going. And now I, I love my life. As I said, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to do with the security industry. I don't drink. Well, sometimes after a match, I'll have like a Guinness or on St. Patrick's Day or something just because I know I can have one and then put it down. I, I, I like that. I feel like uh, it's a big victory. So, yeah, it's a martial arts for me. It's been a cleansing experience. and It's, it's cleansed me because I went into it full of anger, wanting to be able to look after myself, living in a terrible place, like a place where a town where there was riots and whatnot, where news at 10 would be there doing all of uh, these episodes in our area and whatnot. I remember seeing like twocks, seeing a policeman get run over and got put in a wheelchair when I was really young. We lived in a, we lived in a shit hole, you know. But I remember even saying that for all of us in the gutter, but some of us look at the stars and, yeah, I, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to live that.
that life anymore. I never chose that life that I ended up living. I didn't, but I was. I do feel I was a victim of my environment. Not a victim because I survived it. If I'd be, if I was on heroin now, doing the things what some of my old friends are doing now, then then I'd be a victim. But yeah, I was a victor. I became a victor. And now my passion is transforming other people's lives with martial arts, sharing my mistakes, because I feel that you know a fool learns from his own mistakes, and a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So I'm definitely a fool, 100%. And uh, through the grace of God, I'm here to pass on some stories, you know, to pass on stories to others and to share martial arts with them. So I know you've asked me a question, I've gone right, right off on one. But you said before, is there anything you don't want me to speak about? I'm happy to speak about absolutely anything. No skeletons in this closet. Yeah, there you go. I think, I think Let that, them out. That in itself, Chris, is, a, is quite powerful. If you uh, talk about everything and wear it on your sleeve, if you reveal yeah. all your weaknesses. Sure, right, Paul. You have no weaknesses, do you? So. Yeah. You said something that was very interesting there about, you know, essentially not yourself wanted to take your own life, but you wanted people to. Oh, uh, yeah. Kill it. yeah, Where did yeah. That come from? Just uh, inner turmoil, I guess. Yeah. Inner turmoil. And the, 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 the fear of um, not being like that, sorry, the, the fear of dying, I felt was like that was like the fear of being bullied was always bad as a kid. I thought, well, I don't care about dying. It's nothing like me. I'm already dead. I remember reading something once about the samurai class as I was already dead. And I thought, oh, this is good. I remember I was like 14 or something. I written on my wall. My bedroom is better to die than to be a coward. And I, mean, yeah, I think that bullying's a dangerous thing, isn't it? Because it can, it can really mess with somebody. I remember listening to... Jeff Thompson speak because at some point in this story, I met Jeff for the first time. I remember him telling the story about forgiveness, where he forgives the man. I hated it. I was thinking, I hope he's lying. I was thinking, I wish I was there. I'd, I'd have got that man, that all that bloody blah, blah. And then it wasn't until years later I realized that the power of what Jeff had did. And he said that he heard something from Nietzsche where it said, and Nietzsche where it said, be careful when chasing the dragon. You don't become the dragon. And I, I became the dragon. I did. I was. I wanted to chase the dragon. I became the dragon, but now I've slayed the dragon. How, what steps did you have to go to to kind of get past all that repent and? Well, great question. Um, Two thousand and nine. Uh, I, I was. I was going to do something very bad to somebody. Um, yeah, but this he, he, this man needed it. Blah de blah. Um, yeah, but there, I remember. I was a single parent at this point. Had a couple of kids. So it was a it was a funny thing. No, it was a, it was a funny thing. But on this day, it was a Sunday. I remember somebody gave me a book. They said, "Oh, this is for you." One step beyond from Graham Seed went on to be an award-winning book. And he's my best friend. You know, the, he's, he's my pastor, and we became friends up and after, which is crazy. So I'm reading this book. I start reading this book, and it's about it says it's somebody called Nicky Gumbel from um, Holy Trinity Church. I'd written something, he said, Graham's transformation, because Graham was an ex-footballer, really good, tough guy, I knew all about him. Then after coming out of prison, he ended up um, sitting on a bench, became an alcoholic, a drug addict. His life went really, really down, you know, went right down the pan. And um, then some people from, what's this organization called? I forget the organization, I forget the name of the organization, American organization. Um, you know, they went out and they go out in the street, they seen this man's a tramp living on a bench, they go and talk to him, he chased them, get away, get away. But then he, they'd offer him chocolate and stuff, he's like, oh yeah, I'll listen to these. So they're giving him chocolate and we pray for you, yeah, no problem. He's just getting chocolate, they come back every night. And one night he's not there anymore. So then what's going on? He's not there the next night. They check the hospital and they were about to turn off the machine at the hospital, but they said, could we pray for him? Let's give us a chance to pray. As they're praying for him, Graham wakes up but suddenly Graham doesn't want to take drugs anymore. Graham doesn't want to smoke. Graham doesn't want to drink. He's telling people, but he says, I don't want to be a Christian. It's boring. And he's a big mountain of a man, Graham. He's like big six foot seven, six foot eight man mountain. And then he starts, he gets a bike. He's just riding around Middlesbrough telling everybody about Jesus and that he's changed. And they all say, oh, poor lad, he's lost his mind. But fast forward now to about, I don't know, 26 years. He's had keys to the prisons that he used to be in. He's been like a chaplain in prisons and he's impacted so many lives, you know. But when I was uh, reading this book, I heard a voice say, ring Graham. I remember thinking, I heard a voice clearly saying, ring Graham. I thought, man. So I get his number and I ring him, leave a message. And I told him, you know, this was the day after on the Monday because I was outside the man's place. I told him what was happening. I said, I might as well tell you because like, I'm 
It says like, I'm going to, this is it. I'm getting in big trouble, blah, blah, blah. I chatted with him. Anyway, I thought he'll never, ever. No, no, this was on the Sunday. I left the message and it was when I was outside the house. He, ra- he rang me back the next day and I told him, I just told him what, what, like what the crack was. And he said, look, he said, can you do me a favor? I said, well, one thing I said, I don't know who's going to pick my son up from nursery. And he said, well, you must be a good man. He said, because Jesus says that after loving God, loving your family is the next most important thing. And he got me then. I thought, oh, this sounds all right. And then he said, do you know about Nicky Cruz? I said, no, I've never heard of Nicky Cruz. He told me Nicky Cruz was the leader of the Mau Mau, the most violent gang in New York City. And he turned his back on that lifestyle and became a follower of Jesus. A man, David Wilkinson, went out into the, the ghettos in New York and he found him. And he said, Jesus loves you. And he said, if you say that again, I'll cut you into a million pieces. And he said, every one of those million pieces will cry out, Jesus loves you. And Nicky Cruz ran off around the corner and started crying. He didn't know what love was. Nobody had ever told him before. And he said, I'd like to give you the book, One Step Beyond, no, One Step Beyond My Book, and Run Baby Run by Nicky Cruz. So I arranged to meet Graham. And I went and met him the next day. He gave me those two books on a book by David Hamilton, who was a, a terrorist. He was in the mayor's prison. Again, he turned his life around and a study Bible, and we spent all day speaking. He said, can I pray for you? I said, yeah, of course, no problem. He prayed for me. I asked Jesus into my life, and then I felt different. I, started, I remember that night I was pushing a, pushing a trolley around the supermarket with my kids, and I'm smiling at people for no reason, and smiling back, and I used to be so angry, like the, the weight of the world was on my shoulders. Yeah, I remember going into a charity shop and buying something for, for no reason the next day, and the, the old lady said, oh, you're a good man, and I thought, no one's ever said that to me before. And then it was strange. And then a couple of days later, I get a message from Heidi, who's now my wife, saying, no, I'm getting uh, I'm getting baptized. Would you like to come to my baptism? I said, oh, yeah, I've just said a prayer. I'm a Christian now. And she invited me to a prayer meeting. So I ended up in this church. And I thought, I, I trained first. I, I went to do the Thai session. And I was in there. I thought, what am I doing with all these nice people? Like, I thought, these are like what I class as posh people, you know, like educated people. And there's loads of street kids as well, rough kids. I'm thinking, why am I here? These must think, like, what's he doing here? He doesn't belong here, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I wanted to run out, but I, I made a promise to myself, I'll stay this once, then I'm never, ever coming back to church. Not going to happen. Next thing, they start praying and whatnot. Everyone's praying. Praying for me. I started feeling the feeling like I'd never felt before in my entire life. And then when I'm praying for Heidi, I start something, a noise comes out. I didn't know where it was. It was I was praying in tongues. I didn't know what none of this stuff was. And I just felt like I was on top top of the world and so I just turned my back really more or less instantly on that old lifestyle just turned my back on it all give it up and it was lucrative I had some good contracts but then how could I uh how, how could I be going around and being violent and whatnot when I, I, I knew there was a different way it was a different path and uh yeah I chose the the narrow path and it was uh, it was difficult very very difficult but I was put to the test most definitely, but I feel that um, there was a reason for it all. I feel there was a reason for it all, without a doubt. And it's, um, it, it's got better, you know, bit by bit. It's got better and better and better. It's not easy. And I think living this way is harder than living the other way to, you know, it, with, with some things. But this is, the, this is the best way by far. And so now I understand when just forgiven people, I understand, um, I understand why he was doing it massively. If you go back then, when you first met Jeff, because he's uh, yeah. on the podcast not so long ago, he's such a massive influence in so many people's lives, including myself. What was it like to listen to what he was saying back then? Was it yeah. Hard well, like, yeah. Even, even today, some of the stuff he says, I'm, I'm like, going, yeah. I don't get that right. Terrific can't. question. Yeah. Well, it's great. I'll tell you a couple of stories as well. I have things like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a couple of stories. Like this book here, I know I keep getting this book up. I, I, this was just there. It was written, and I was never going to do anything with it. And back end of last year, Jeff Thompson pops up on a podcast. Like, wow, Jeff Thompson's back because he's kind of like not not being on the scene, has he? And he says, but he had a book where he just wasn't going to bring it out, and then he did. And I thought, I'm bringing this out, so he's a big influence on me. Like, if Jeff Thompson says do something, there's a good chance I go and try it because I have full faith in him because I've watched him change. You know, he's like a different man, isn't he? From when he's like, you know, he's traps up here and he's teaching the submissions and he's got a big gold Rolex on and he's like, he's talking about fighting now. He's all about peace and you know, it's good. He's a peaceful warrior now. But uh, I first ever heard of Jeff Thompson. I'd have been 14 and uh, I bought a, it was fighting arts magazine. He's on the front doing moves, but dressed in the door uniform. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, this is like, 
this is the real deal, you know. Then I start buying his books, I'd always be buying his books. Real punching really helped me massively out of faint and whatnot. Yeah, and I thought he was a terrific martial artist, but it was in this stage before I got into the fight with the wrestler who 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 went on to become a world class martial uh, mixed martial artist as well. We became great friends to add to that story and we ended up working together on the doors and being training partners. So that was a good story. He introduced me to wrestling. I started teaching him striking and we trained together. So that was the power of martial arts. But with Jeff, I, he was doing a book signing at Waterstones in Middlesbrough. And I'd been out that weekend. So I, it was a Monday and I wasn't feeling good. I got in there a little bit late. And when he's talking about all this forgiveness and all that, it, it was too much for me to handle. I didn't want to forgive anybody at all. I had a lot of anger in me. and I, I wasn't forgiving anybody at that point. I'd have been about 20 years old and I didn't have a drop of forgiveness in my body <laughs> back then. And uh, it'll have been 2010 when I first like went and trimmed him. I did his master class. That was amazing. I absolutely loved it. And I, I was ready then because I'd give my heart to Jesus and whatnot, like about a year before. But the funny thing is, I went out to Brazil, uh, like my fifth trip to Brazil, my wife for our honeymoon. And, and I was carrying a bit of an injury. And I got injured. And I thought, I'm just knocking it on the head because I'd had a serious injury with uh, my discs. And they said I'd never be able to train again. Although I did train again, I competed again and whatnot. Went on for a lot long after that. I think sometimes doctors just don't understand about training. The other thing, like, you know, just don't do it. If it causes this, don't do it. But we went up to um, Cristo Hedento. You know, we went up and there's a church inside of it. That, but actually, I prayed at the top. It was cloudy. I just said, I'm, I'm going to give it one, one, more, one more go. I'll give martial arts one more go because I was ready to knock it on the head. Now I went on that course with Jeff and I was and I thought, yeah, this is, I've got to keep on going. And I'm so glad that I did. I've got to carry on. And I did carry on. And um, yeah, I loved it because he, he reads a lot. Jeff's probably the reason I started to read because I'd read his books because it was to do with something that I loved, fighting, martial arts, all these stories. But then he's speaking about, when he's doing talks, he's, he's speaking about reading like books. But I think that if... If you read books like that, where I was from, you probably, like, <laughs> people think you're out of your mind, you know what I mean? I started to read books about everything. I became crazy for reading. I don't know how many books I've read. Like, my house is just, my house is full of books. And yeah, Jeff's a big, a big part of that. And I guess to do with, like, when I was really young, I used to pray and stuff. And then I stopped. But yeah, when a man like, a man like that, a tough man, will stand up speak about God, I think that's powerful. Super, super powerful. And it had a big, big impact on me. It did. Massive impact on me. What was it like in Brazil? How do, how are you? Uh, how you were, were you received? And what time? What era or year were you there? When I first went was two thousand and three. It would have been September or October time, just after the Mundials, and no, or just after the the Masters. So yeah, about September, October. I went for a couple of months that first time, and well, I didn't really know these people who it would arrange for me to go. So I contacted Marcelo Yogi because somebody gave me his email. I didn't even know how to use it, what an email was. I'd heard of it. I just didn't, I didn't have a clue. I wasn't educated. I didn't go to school much. I was an idiot. You know, I was a fool. So then I find out I used this email. I met the first email I ever sent was to Marcelo Yogi at Gracie Bar Hipponema. Yeah, come and train. He had broken English. I had no Portuguese. I didn't even know the, what language I spoke in Brazil. I, I, I had no idea. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the language of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> so I went to the National Submission League and uh, Neil Owen was there, one of the coaches from Gracie Bar Doncaster, and I said, I'm going to Brazil. I told him, he went, oh, you're really serious, aren't you? He said, well, we're going back out there. Just give me a book of flight, send me, uh, like, here's my number, tell me what it is, somebody will meet you. So there's a guy called Ben Poppleton was going to meet me, who I'd only met once. I'm sure you've heard of Ben, he's a great guy. And uh, so yeah, I get there. I remember I didn't know anything about booking flights. So I get a flight from Newcastle to Charles de Gaulle, France, with like an eight hour layover. <laughs> so I didn't have a clue. So all throughout the night, I'm just bored, stiff. And then I get on this flight from it'd be like 10 and a half hours, I think, from Charles de Gaulle to Rio. So I'm exhausted. Now I remember thinking, I don't think this fella's going to land up. I just thought, what am I going to do? So I thought, I'm going to get a taxi. Just say Gracie Jiu Jitsu. That was that was my uh, that was my plan. Get in the taxi and say Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So who knows where they would have taken me? But I get out, get through customs, and then Ben's there. I remember I thought it was cool because we're getting outside. Ben speaking Portuguese. The taxi driver. Like, I like this. This is like this is good. And then we get in the taxi. And when you when you get to Brazil, I love Brazil. It's like the feeling, the tropical feeling. As soon as you get off that, 
off the airplane, you feel it, it's different. I, I love it, you know, I love it. And then we're driving, there's all the palm trees and Ben saying, oh, this is where it's all about, this is where it all started. And uh, it was like something off a martial arts movie or something. I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I remember give Ben some money, can you get this, uh, can, you, can you get this money changed for me? And to like, he eyes and like, Ben's, I remember Ben years later saying that's the dirtiest grand I've ever, <laughs> ever seen in my life. It was like, just like crumpled up bits of money and all that. And I, 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 I didn't have a bank account still at that time, do you know what I mean? And then, yeah, it was amazing. The training, the training was hard, but the training at Gracie Bar Doncaster was equally hard because it was just spar, 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 spar. Back then in Brazil, you'd do a couple of techniques. You'd run around, bits of condition, a couple of techniques, and then roll, roll, roll. The black belts there wouldn't do any of the running around. They wouldn't drill. The black belts are there. And like They're just against that far wall. There's just black belts, as long as you can see. And then there's lots of browns, purples, blues, and whites, like me. And back then, we didn't have grouse. We didn't have stripes. That, that came out years later. And... Um, yeah, it was good, you know, it, it, but, but then when the black belts come on, they're all, they're warmed up by getting a white belt, so I'd be, like, given to, like, these world-class Jiu-Jitsu kills and just get smashed, 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 but it was good. I loved every minute of it, yeah, but um, I was getting smashed, smashed, smashed every day, morning, night, morning, night, and I remember thinking, ah, oh, private lessons, this is a good idea, and then I'd get private lessons for, like, 15-pound English with uh, Roberto Gordo, like, man, he's, like, top of the food chain he helped me so so much and whatever god was teaching me i'm going back and i, I bought a notepad i'm writing it down writing it down writing it down and then i remember say i get was put somebody for instance say he submits me 10 times next day i think he's only getting me nine no more than nine then eight and in the end i started to get where i could really like look after myself to do with i started to understand it's like learning a new language isn't it with martial arts it was like i didn't speak that wasn't even conversational do you know what i mean and these people could like uh, write theses about like jujitsu so i was just totally totally out of my comfort zone and uh, i was just thinking i can't quit i've got to keep going got to keep going and then i didn't realize really how much i'd improved until i came back and people that i thought were really good i was going through them like a hot knife through butter it was like uh I was at a different speed altogether. I was just at a different speed. And then I went out to, um, you know, I actually had an amateur MMA match with a man called Stumpy Reigns, who was a, he was a world strongman competitor and Mr. Universe, a big tank of a man. And I knew the man who was running the show and somebody pulled out. I said, I'll jump in because I thought, it's just, just a chance to have a pull about before the European Championships. It was the first European Championships that were to take place. And I believe it was January 2004. So I had that match, won that, went out to, Went out to Lisbon, and yeah, I got a big mountain of a man in the final there. He was a, called Attila. He was half uh, German, half Turkish, and I ended up beating him. And yeah, I think I was the first, because he was the first one. I was a white, I was the first man to ever win a, a, a goal. I looked was that white belt in the uh, in, in a actual European Championships. Yeah, that was fun, an experience. And then went back out to Brazil again. You know, I was just like, I was on a roll then. I loved it. Then we started bringing Brazilians back bringing people for seminars. And so I brought Legato to the country for the first time, got him lots of seminars and stuff. Yeah, it was fun. We had like Hodja and Mauricio at our academy. Yeah, it was great, great times. It really was great times. How did you then, from being kind of so in the jiu-jitsu scene, how did you find catch wrestling? Yeah, <laughs> that jiu-jitsu scene was a little bit crazy as well because I, I loved it in Brazil. You know, I loved it in Brazil so much. It was just train. And back here, it was like a time where you got to think these Brazilian people, a lot of them, they didn't have money. They wanted to, to make money. And then, you know, the one, it was all about the business. And I, I didn't like that. I remember what I'd be getting, like, told off all the time. But yes, man, you try to kill everybody. And bloody blah, blah, no, <laughs> you pitch ball, you crazy, you know, that. I need my poodles and all this crack. And I understand now I run a gym, but yeah, I was thinking, well, I've been getting smashed. Like, I know I, I'm getting smashed every day, non-stop, never complain, no, in Brazil. So I'm just going the way that I've been trained, which was go, 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 go. I was competing and whatnot. So, yeah, I didn't understand that. And now it's all about flow rolling and this and that. And that didn't exist then. I'm glad I did it before that was really something. Do you know what I mean? Well, let, let, that's a good time to ask you this, Chris. Do you think, because there's quite a few high-level trainers in America uh, who have said that they think it's been watered down or the, the new kind of systemic approach or systematic approach to building yeah. schools and stuff it essentially waters it down. I mean, it's business, agree? isn't it? Yeah, it's business now. Well, I remember 
we were there when like the, maybe it's 2004, something like this. We, I competed in the, uh, the Rio Strait Championships that year and got, I got robbed in the final. You know, if you're a gringo, man, you better submit them if you want to draw. <laughs> so they, they give the decision to this Brazilian. I was like, what? And uh, yeah, but you see, for, back then Brazilians had to, had to qualify for Mundials, but foreigners didn't. So by me, I'm like sort of taking someone's spot. Like so it was like they'll think, why is he even doing this? I didn't realize I just wanted to compete. Yeah, then we were there with the guy, you know, Major Major John, Papa John, John Gorman. And I believe that he's 50% owner or something of Gracie Bar and the IFPJJ, IF, whatever it's called, that, that federation. So, so when you look at it, this is what's crazy about jiu-jitsu. Kalinos Gracie is the head of Gracie Baja. And he's the head of the biggest uh, organization that sanctions all the events. So, like, when you, I remember when I go to compete, I think, oh, the referee, and all these referees, they're from the academy. So, it's kind of, it's like, uh, it's business. But I remember Papa John, we'd go for dinner with him. Obviously, we all speak English, he'd say. He was like, he's a great guy, by the way. He was like, he won a Purple Heart in Vietnam and stuff, an old school guy. And he said, we're taking jujitsu to America. He said, we can't stay here. He said, I was at the Mundial. He said, I saw a pigeon taking a shit on the mat. He said in the black during the black belt final. <laughs> I was like, I was like, no. Nah. I was thinking people they're not going to go to America. I was wrong because they're all in America now, you know. And it's I believe that America has did great things for jujitsu, and I feel the jujitsu in America is different than the jujitsu in Brazil because of the wrestling base. People are so good at, at wrestling. I think that, and, I, and let's look at the UFC. Obviously, it was the Brazilian family that created it but it was in America and I think that America, it's a land of opportunity and I think that America has been great for jiu-jitsu and yeah, I think that what those guys are saying about maybe he's calling it, you could say yeah, watered down in the fact that it's not as intense for, for people when they first start but also if it had stayed like that, it would never have grown in the way that it has but I just feel that you know, we have to be careful as well, you know, because obviously high level, yeah, it's amazing, the great athletes and whatnot. But I don't know, now I think the people just feel that they're entitled to get belts and whatnot and entitled to get, people seem really happy about the stripes. And I remember being around Brazilians when this stripe thing was first coming out and they were like laughing about it, saying, oh, these group, but they're talking to me, but as if like I'm not a gringo because I'm around that much. All these gringos are going to like to get stripes on the belt and they're going to give you money and they're going to be happy and tell their friends and take photos. So they're thinking like, I was thinking, <laughs> the fuck, I don't, I don't care what color a belt is, let alone a stripe. I don't care, you know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah, it, it's business. It's business, isn't it? It's business. And um, Chris, yeah, you, you, Chris you put, you're pulling the curtain not open now. This is like, this is like the so moment. This is, what, this is like the moment the everybody, uh, everybody found out what kayfabe meant in wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all this stripe shit and blah, blah, I, I don't care about it. I don't care. I love what Gordon Ryan's doing now. He's just beating everybody, isn't he? He's saying this isn't jiu-jitsu. This is scrimmage wrestling. And it's amazing. I love jiu-jitsu. You know, don't get me wrong, but there's so many different types of jiu-jitsu. You know, it's, it's like, what is jiu-jitsu? Because suddenly they bring in all of the, the leg locks. So, you know, since Eric Paulson was booed out of the Pan Ams in the 90s for leg lock on everybody to win gold. It's crazy. I remember putting a heel hook on somebody when I was a white belt in Gracie Bay, Brazil. Grace, no, no, no. Then years later, when I was a portal belt at a Hoist Gracie seminar, uh, Niba, the guy who was another portal belt, and he's a good, a good local guy, competitor, no leg locks, but I'm competing like MMA and we train everything. So I was like, I, I was kind of, to answer your question, I was getting a little bit disillusioned with what I was allowed to do or I had to wait until somebody gave me a certain color belt before I could do this move. And I just thought, man, and then, yeah, I won the Gracie Invitation on that blue belt, but then didn't get the chance to compete the next year at the higher belt. And, and the people who I'd beat there were at the higher belt. And I thought, like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I just, I'd rather get smashed by the best than beat somebody where I felt that I was better than them. So I just kind of, I couldn't be bothered. But with the competitive side of it, I've trained jiu-jitsu always, you know, but we train for, for self-defense. We train for everything. We just train. We just grapple for me, whether I'm doing catch, sambo, jiu-jitsu. I've been training with Georgie Georgiev for now for almost nine years as well. He's had a massive impact on our on our grappling. Not only is he a top sambo player, he's also really good for Greco-Roman and judo as well. I just feel it's all a, a rule set because what we're seeing now, the jiu-jitsu, I love what jiu-jitsu are doing where they're just bringing everything in and they're just calling it jiu-jitsu and that's what catch wrestling did. The British Navy, the British Empire went around the world. They're learning things from Kushti wrestling in India, 
yeah, it's wrestling, it's wrestling, just added it all in. And I think that that's, um, I think that's really good. Like with judo, they're taking everything out, taking leg grabs out, this and that. It's a shame. I remember speaking with a fantastic coach, Mr. Jack Mountford. He's an amazing, amazing martial artist. He was in his 70s, I believe. He was killing us all with fitness. We couldn't keep up with him. And he's a, he's a high-ranking judoka and a top cat wrestler. And he said that um, all these techniques, all these moves that are outlawed, he just puts them back in and he just trains them all at his school. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's the way forward. Like with cats, you have some, some organizations where they don't allow you to choke and whatnot. For me, do it all, I think. Like if you're a fully group, if you're a man, you know, just do it, just get stuck in if you're a kid yeah i understand but that's why i love catch the no holds bad aspect where it doesn't matter about what color belt somebody has you don't have to uh you know, it has to be nice for somebody for them to give you a stripe and get a photograph took with you or anything like that you just shake hands and you get on the mat if you're a catch wrestler you'll shake hands you'll get on the mat any submission goes you get on there and it's good you're, you're respected instantly you just respect it from day one and i love the conditioning that goes with it it's it's a different way of training. It's not that anything's better than anything else. It's it's different. Like when you train, you'll train crazy amounts of conditioning. It's like, it's a test of will. And you know, th this is one thing that I really love from catch and that I don't like with jiu-jitsu. I feel that the attitude sometimes is too relaxed. People, every time there's a mission, they want to slap the hands and fist bump you and all this. And there can be that many roles going on. Man, I remember being in Gracie Academy in Torrance. There was hundreds of people on the mat. You couldn't move. Great for business, but people can't move you know and so if there's all these people sparring how can the coach see what's going on people can be reinforcing mistakes time and time again and i feel that a coach and a trainer are two different things because a trainer for me it's like painting by number They're just like yeah here's the technique get on with it where a coach this is the technique but for your body type i think you should do this and you've had this injury you need to be careful of this and for me a coach is gonna how i have it we do it the catch way when it's rolling what we're doing color it's wrestling you come out, two people wrestling, everybody's watching. Stop. Try this. You should have done this. And it's coaching. And then whoever wins stays on and we do things like this. That This is the old school way. And I feel that that's vital. Yeah, the, old, the other way, has a, that, that's important too. But, um, you know, you can just have so many people doing, people say spazzy white belt, you know, and I don't like that term because whose fault is it? The coaches. Because for me, um, it's my responsibility when I coach somebody, it's my responsibility that they learn. So if they're doing something wrong, it's, it's on me. The onus is on me and not on them. So, yeah. That's... How, Chris, explain, just say for the listeners who've never heard the terminology catch as catch can wrestle in, explain to, explain to them what it is, essentially. Yeah, it's no hold bad wrestling so you can beat them with any submission or you can pin them on the back for a count of three. And normally you have to beat them best two or three so you'll have to beat them twice so it's good the better man will win people say oh you 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 can pin to beat them yeah and i think that's great for mma because i know some people do a lot of nice things when they're sitting on the floor and whatnot but start striking them it's different i feel that it forces the wrestling it forces the sense of it gives a sense of urgency and it makes you work on your wrestling and for me each to their own but i really enjoy practicing that style i like it a lot like, yeah, I don't mind freestyle, blah, blah, blah. But for me, wrestling, always wrestling had submissions. It's a new thing that submissions are being taken out of wrestling. If you look on those caves and whatnot from thousands of years ago, and jiu-jitsu is wrestling. It's all wrestling. It is wrestling. I remember, you know, I have some good friends, traveling lads that have been training me for a long, long time. And they get me a moves that I knew was catch. I'd say, what's this? I'd say, just wrestling. I remember speaking with Billy Robinson, God rest his soul, when he uh, came to teach a seminar in 2011 hour school. And I told him about them. I said, they call it just wrestling. And he said, well, if they've learned from old timers, they know that catch as catch can is just wrestling. And it is, it's just wrestling. I remember that day I felt sad when Billy came because he, he'd not been to England for 30 years and catch had been forgotten. He couldn't believe it. And when you think he trained the great Sakuraba in Brazil, uh, sorry, in Japan, and uh, he, you know, he'd beat four of the Gracies in the heyday and pride. And he was like, what's going on? And I made a vow that day. I told my good friend, Steve Dawson, I said, we're going to make catch wrestling popular again. And I've did everything that I can to, to help it on its way a little bit. You know, and I'm working now with people from overseas. I'm also, I run a monthly session when it's not locked down, where people come from all around the country. I'm coaching coaches. We have kids programs. We have a lot going on. And, you know, obviously, I've learned such a lot from St. Eric Paulson. That's been a total blessing. 
You know, and that, that all came about really by, we went out to Amin and myself, my good friend and student Amin, went out to compete in England versus, no, USA versus the world in 2014 in California. And th th this is a funny story. This story really, uh, what happened this day really helped as well. We got there late on the night, flew away and we had to get up early to go to the Fox. We, we, we were on Good Morning LA doing techniques and whatnot. Really fun day, really trying to promote this uh, tournament that was happening at the John Wooden Center, UCLA. So I said, well, why don't we just get a taxi and we'll go to Venice Beach, you know, let's get some sun and whatnot. Because obviously we'd had a flight, let's get into the sea a little bit. And as I'm walking, I hear a man shouting, you're fucking lucky. Like a crazy voice, you're fucking lucky. You're fucking lucky. I'm looking and there's a man sat there and he's looking at me. You're fucking lucky. And we're getting close to doing him. And I'm thinking, this like this is early on the morning, but Venice Beach is crazy. There's crackheads, there's everything there. It's like... It's a crazy, it's a crazy, crazy place. People coming up, can you give money for kids with AIDS? It's like absolutely crazy. And so he's drinking a bottle of Bud. He had like long ponytail, long beard. I'm thinking, man, look at him. But he had a vest on, he was jacked. I looked down, he had all bottles of Bud down by, on the floor. And I noticed he had a prosthetic leg. He's still shouting, you're fucking lucky. And he had a thousand yards then. I remember saying to him as we got past, man, that poor man, he, I think you remember he's a war hero, blah, blah, blah. And instantly we see another man with a prosthetic leg come, come flying past in this direction in a wheelchair training early on the morning. I went, look at that. I said, what was the odds? What were the odds of us being here now? And what were the odds of us seeing that? I said, see him there, Mr. You're fucking lucky. And he chose to be a victim. That he chose to be a victim. I said, he's fucking lucky too, because he's not dead. Some of his, some of his friends might be dead. I said, and that other man, I said, he chose to be the victor. I said, and we have that choice. Always we have that choice. And I remember when we went there, I was, I was a bit down because we met somebody who was part of the CSW. And it was like, yeah, she'd asked Sensory, we would go there and train. But we didn't have enough money to get to that part of California. We were on like, uh, we could afford to eat once a day. Like everything was rationed out. We were staying in a real bad area. We were in Inglewood. It was dodgy. It was where the Phil and Boys in the Hood. It was like we were, we, we wanted to go out there. We wanted to give it our best shot. So I remember when I came back, that was just echoing in my mind. that I didn't have a car at the time. I'd, I'd run to train and coach, run back. And that was, that was in my mind. You know, I, you're fucking lucky. It became a mantra. And that, that, that became the book. So, yeah, That's I am book. fucking lucky, 100%. <laughs> what, uh, how was it receiving? Because it was um, Sensei Eric Paulson from CWS that gave you your black belt, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a black belt second degree under yeah. Sensei Eric, yeah. So that, that's a huge honour. And I, also, I'm, it's a huge honour that I'm a um, level two coach in CSW. For me, the yes, CSW yes. system, it's... Combat submission wrestling, it's, it's where, well, since Eric says it's where jiu-jitsu and catch wrestling shake hands. And obviously he was shooter world champion back in the day, uh, in the early 90s. It's like, it's got sambo in there. It's, it's got everything in there. For me, it's the perfect blend of grappling for MMA and for self-defense. It, it's awesome. It really is. It's, uh, it's good. You know, don't get me wrong. I love the gi. I wear the gi like five times a week or something. But not having it on is what I love. I love the no gi a lot more. There's, uh, there's not a lot of you guys kind of in England from the catch. Uh, did yourself, um, uh, I am Mongoose. Uh, Ian Mongoose, yeah. It's funny because Ian was part of like, we were part of the same jiu-jitsu school in Doncaster as well. We've, we've known each other for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and Ian uh, trains at the Snake Pit with Roy Wood in Wigan. And yeah, we used to go and compete for them as well. Al Al Amin and myself, we went out and competed two years on the bounce in America competing for the Snake Pit and Wigan. Yeah, then there's obviously, there's the guys at Atherton are really good, like Jack Mountford, who I mentioned, the old gentleman, who was a formidable uh, grappler and coach, and he's trained Darren Morris, who's a real, real good guy. He has a lot of guys there, like Lee Chadwick, a lot of good lads who do more with MMA. There was the Ian Bromley, my, my, my good friend, God, God rest his soul too, he was doing a really good job. And then obviously, there's men like Danny Mitchell, who although they're well-known for MMA, ex-UFC fighter and whatnot, and trains the top UFC men now. His style, he does everything, catch included. So yeah, there's not a, there's not a great deal of people out there, but even in the world, there isn't a great deal of people out there really pushing it. And I think it's because it's, there's no instant gratification with catch. You're not going to get a belt. You're not going to get a certificate. You're not going to get right. anything like that. You've got, yeah, you've got to really love it. You've got to love it. And I, I like it that it's like that in a way, to tell you the truth. But then you also get people who I feel are getting involved because um, maybe some people, I think, wouldn't humble themselves and go and put a white belt on and go and study jiu-jitsu. 
there's that hierarchy thing in jiu-jitsu it's got its it's got its strengths and it's got its weaknesses hasn't it so yeah i think that for me train everything compete everything do it all i've competed even in sumo amateur sumo like just train and compete. Your athletic window is not going to be open for long. Who knows how long you're going to even be able to get on the mat and train for. I just think put it all aside and train. Do whatever you like. Do what you like and do it often. It's a shame now that the war master, Josh Barnett's kind of retiring as well because he was a good representation of catch. Amazing. You know, the greatest in the catch MMA wrestler thing. ever. Yeah. Without a doubt, the greatest catch wrestler of, of, of all. You know, he's well, he, he knows so much and he's such a... He's smart. You know, you don't stay in the, the top 10 for pro MMA in the world for 20 years, do you, if you're not smart? He's super smart. The youngest ever UFC champion. He won the Jiu-Jitsu Nogi World Championships. You know, he's, yeah, he's a, an amazing, uh, not, not just a grappler, but a martial artist. I think his striking is underrated. When you look, you know, uh, Crow Cop used to elect to take him down a lot of the time. He's got really good striking. Did you watch his fight in Poland where it was, bare knuckle boxing with elbows a few months ago that was really good I think he, I think he'll still fight you know I think there's I think there's still a lot of fight left in the world master what the but yeah obviously he, him and Sakuraba they're the guys that really went out and did it uh, in the MMA world what, what got me on to when you did your catch wrestling seminar in Coventry was the fact that probably about six months before one of my mates who got me into jiu-jitsu was a patient of mine had sent me this link and he went watch this and it was uh, it was Josh Barnett versus Dean Lister at Polaris. Yeah, and he it was a big come match. Out in the wrestling gear, and it was a, yeah, a in his trunks. A, a bit of a salute to Carl Gotch, and um, amazing. It was cool, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I've had the chance to train with him a couple of times. You know, he always learns. So Chloe's a really, really good coach. Really well, he is, a, and obviously a got a chance to have a match with him as well. Yeah, which yeah. is and how that came about was crazy. <laughs> I was club promoting an event with Joel Bain from Snake Pit USA out in the US, so World Championships. And then Josh Barnett threw his name in that. We're like, no way, this is like amazing. Who's going to do this? And people were reluctant to have the match, you know, although there was some people that would, but it was going to cost money. I said, Joel, I said, I'll just jump in, no problem. I said, I'll take you for the team. And I thought, I'd love that opportunity, of course, but I felt a little bit cheeky saying, oh, yeah, I'll have this match. I said, oh, my, do you know what I mean? To try and have a match with him. And uh, But then, anyway, I just said, I don't even want to promote. I just want this match. Then so something happened. It ends up getting back to Josh, where I'd said, "No, yeah." Then they offered me somebody else a rematch with Luis Ojeda, who was American heavyweight champion. We wrestled to a draw. And I said, "Look, I said I wasn't interested in competing anymore, Joel. I'll compete against Josh Barnett, and that, that's all I, I would have did just to help you out." But anyway, Josh Barnett messages me. I've heard you'll only compete if it's against me. No problem. See you in New Jersey. <laughs> I didn't want to explain myself. I thought you think I'm a shit. I went, "Oh yeah, nice one." So then starts training. I. I um, I tore my biceps, so what a nightmare for the last four weeks. Couldn't really wrestle. Bloody blah, blah, flew out. Yeah. yeah, can you remember? Yeah. Flew out to uh, flew out to New York, then to go out to New Jersey, but then Josh Barnett had been injured as well, so the match was off. And then yeah, came we ended up doing it a few months later in England. But that was a that was awesome to have that opportunity, you know, to to get in there and wrestle him, yeah, one hundred percent. What was it like locking up with him? Not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, he well, always says that when you, when you grab hold of someone, you should make them second guess that, that, that they're even in there, that they want to even wrestle and all that. And yeah, that's his whole mindset, breaking people. And it was really good. You know, I, I wouldn't swap that experience for anything because what, after that, I just felt like I improved. Yeah, it's funny when you've been and competed against somebody good or even rolled with somebody good. I think that you take a little bit of them with you. And the way I felt, I can only compare it to like rolling jiu-jitsu or Audrey Gracie when I was like a blue belt or something. It's like, you know, them men when they're that level. It's a different level. There's levels to this. There's there's levels when people are like good, good, world class good. It's a different, it's a different thing altogether. Somebody has said to me, I remember one of my coaches saying, Oh, just in catch if you just keep out the way, it's declared a, a draw, just keep out the way. I went, you fucking Joe, when I'm going forward, I wanna I wanna test him, I wanna try to beat him. It looked as if it was saying, but I'd rather lose trying to win than trying to not engage, you know. So I said, we'll do it in the ring, blah de blah And like, I knew he's great with takedowns because I watched him in Pride and UFC. He's really good at putting you against the ring and taking you down. He did, did it twice. And yeah, I wouldn't change that for the world. I think it's great. To, I always say it, the kids' eyes on front like to hunt, eyes on the side like to hide. So I feel that as a catch wrestler, you should always go forward and try your best. If you lose, it does not matter at all. That's good. Where, where, uh, what's the kind of... 
with the school at the moment, Egypt Pro Wrestling, what's the what's the kind of plan? I suppose. God, I mean, you in such a right now thing. we're doing we're doing a lot online, but with mainly kickboxing. Our STS kickboxing program has been good right now. It's hard to teach grappling online, isn't it, for kids? It's like you know, it's it's really difficult. We have a lot of uh, junior members. Once we're allowed to open back up again, I cannot wait. We have a huge waiting list as people want to come every night, jiu-jitsu, every night catch, every night STS kickboxing, something for everybody. And it's a real good, uh, it's very family orientated. Obviously, I'm in there with all my children. My wife coaches alongside me. It's a total blessing. We're in Sun Seeds Ministries. It's, uh, it's good. We've got a good setup. That's good, Chris. Have you ever considered... Uh, kind of doing what, following Josh's footsteps and going and working the uh, the pro wrestling side of things. I, I love pro wrestling. I've grown up loving it. And I remember once I took my kids to the pro wrestling, like an indie show here, and the guy said, do you want to get involved? So, well, yes, yeah. so I went out the back. So anyway, I got involved. It was good crack. So I went in and like the man threw a shot and I twisted him up, threw him out the ring and all that. And the crowd loved it. He was saying, you've got to do this. You won the crowd over. You were good on the mic. Said no, no, no. Then I went back the next time. I'd had a catch match that day. It was the first match that I'd have to lose uh, to Josh Barnett. I beat Johnny Robb, who was a good MMA, local MMA fighter. So it was good to get a victory into my belt so soon after. Then he said, Dude, This guy's going to call. I went, No, no, no. I was like, exhausted when you compete. You, you, you're tired out, aren't you? You know, my central nervous system was taking a batter, and I just wanted to, like, I just wanted to eat something like sugary or something like that. I was, I was flat. So anyway, this man gets the mic and starts shouting all that. <laughs> I'm like, my wife said, you're going to have to get in? Because like, you're going to, I was like, no way. So I get in and I end up putting him in a Boston Crab or something like that. Then the crowd's all loving it. And this man saying, look, I think that you should do this. It's a chance to showcase catch wrestling, blah, de, blah. But then, yeah, I never, I, I never did. But uh, I think it's good. You know, I like that side of it. I think it's an art form. And you know, I think them guys are super, super tough. I heard Daniel call me say he went to try out and he said it was too tough for him. And that's an Olympian who's a two times UFC champion. So it's a different type of toughness. Even when you go playing judo and when you're getting thrown nonstop, nonstop, you're having to let people throw you for like an hour, an hour and a half. It's hard. I've always thought it's really, judo's really tough. Anything like that. And then them men are super, super tough. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm 44 this year. I think my days of all that are like, no, I think I get enough injuries doing the other stuff, doing the catch. <laughs> would you be a uh, Would you be a heel or a baby face? <laughs> Depends how I feel on the day. <laughs> I don't know. I think that I've, I've always, I've always, uh, I've always kind of got behind the heel. You know, I liked it when Hulk Hogan uh, turned badass. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they probably don't get enough respect because of the. The stuff that the trauma that they put their body through on the circuit. It's yeah. Incredible. And when you look, Brock Lesnar, Ronda Rousey, Josh Barnett, Kazushi Sakuraba, even now Harry Smith, son of Davy Boy Smith, a British bulldog, and the daughter of Diane Hart, the um, the, the sister of Brett the Hitman Hart. That man, he, he's a man mountain, and he trains a lot with Josh Barnett. There's some tough, tough men and women in that uh, in that industry. Shayna Bears was the champion, I believe, or she was a champion in WWE, trained by Josh Barnett and Eric Paulson. You know, these are, these are the real deal. She's also fought in the UFC. And what, what the UFC is pro wrestling anyway. <laughs> What's all, Conor McGregor back running about uh, in, the, in, in the parking area, throwing things at us. WWF were doing that 20 years ago. All that trash talk and stuff, it's like, it's just bullshit, isn't it? It's, you know, that, that's fake. All that that's fake, and we all know that people are from fights left, right, and center in every sport, and not just in fight sports, but in football, rugby. It's business, isn't it? You know, people just need to relax and realize that that pro wrestling is it, it's a real business, and uh, people don't go and watch a movie and say, Oh, that's fake, it's good, but it's fake. Don't watch a Bruce Lee movie or Jackie Chan and say that. I think that you have to respect it for what it is. Well, he, he's a big fan, isn't he? Dana White's a big fan of uh. Uh, yeah, man. I think he's yeah, I think he's learned a lot from Vince, hasn't he? He's a smart man. I think Dana White's the greatest fight promoter that's ever lived. Look at boxing. Imagine if boxing had a Dana White, how good it would be. I get sick to death. I, I don't even like watching boxing anymore, to be honest. It's like they're just they're not wanting to fight each other much. I only really watch if it's Tyson Fury, to be honest. That'd be good. And, and he's an entertainer, isn't he? He brings a lot to the table. Yeah, I think it's is his story about how he's kind of uh, got through adversity that's pretty amazing as well so that, yeah. that, 
You know, that's quite true for, for him to lay it all out there. Amazing. Day. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm not perfect. I'm a human. I'm a man. And I made all these mistakes, you know, but he back, when he came back, it was incredible. I never liked him. Amazing. I, I, I just, I used to switch off. He was like white noise before. And then I'd what he did back. to Wilder, absolutely amazing. Now he got off the canvas at overtime. I do not know. I just got nothing but respect for him now. I think he oh, man. And he went out and beat Klitschko in 2015. Nobody, Joshua didn't want that fight then, you know. And Joshua got them belts because Tyson Fury got them and freed them from Klitschko. And I know he beat Klitschko, but he beat him like 18 months after. And it was a war. He had to get up off the canvas. Tyson Fury just boxed the face right off him. I just think I've talked to a friend of mine sparred with, I know it's only sparred, one big gloves. He sparred with Fury and he sparred with Joshua. And he said this, he said it's just a different thing altogether. He went, Tyson Fury is a different thing. You think you're out of range, you hit three times and he's gone. It's like fighting a ghost with a hammer in his hand. That big as well. Um, Chris, yeah. you, once all this kind of COVID malarkey is all done and dusted, are you jumping back on the seminar scene? Are you going to be going out? Doing yeah, be, yeah I, I was planning a seminar in uh, Wolverhampton, but I can't get hold of the fellow that wanted me to do it. I went through for him once and I know some people have paid deposits. So if anybody's paid a deposit for my seminar, I'll honour it, of course. So just tell me that you have send me like your screenshot or something no problem and the seminar will go on but I'll be doing it with somebody else because uh, yeah the, the, we'll be back in Wolverhampton seminar was amazing and we're going to have our monthly ones here and I'll be getting out to the other affiliate clubs around the country most definitely yeah I love doing this Brilliant. So you've started doing affiliate legit pro wrestling clubs as well? Yeah, yeah. Just helping people to train towards that catch as catch rule set. I think it's important to keep the bit of a, the history and the heritage of English wrestling alive. British wrestling, you know, Jim Essen was Scottish. He was a world champion. It's a, and a lot of it come from Ireland, I, I, Irish collar and elbow. I think that we've got to keep our history alive, most definitely. And let's not forget the influence that uh, Catch had on jiu-jitsu because, you know, uh, Maeda was a catch wrestler too. The Gracies were catch wrestling promoters. That's how they met. I know they changed the history and whatnot, but it's all there. And I know that they fell out with George because he was doing work matches. And what's the Gracie challenge? It comes from catch wrestling, doesn't it? And you look, look at UFC 1 when you look at it, you know, the, the promoter's brother's fighting a boxer with one glove on and he beats the pro wrestler, the, the WWF wrestler Ken Shamrock. In the, a couple after, he beats Dan to be Severin. You know, I was chatting with Dan to be Severin. I asked him about Hoyce and he said, he doesn't want to be in the same room as me. I said, why? He said, he's scared I tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. We're gonna <laughs> we'll leave it at that for that for today, mate. Um, listen, it's been great having a good chat with you, mate. I really appreciate uh, you coming on today, and um, hopefully, when all this is, is done and dusted, we'll I'll do a little visit up to the school, and then we'll do. That'd be two. great, brilliant. That'd be great, and you know, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the chance to come on. I've always loved going through the Coventry, the great guys through there. You know, I've learned a lot from obviously Jeff Thompson, uh, Matty, Tony. Great guys, really good guys through there. And I look forward to getting back through again, not just to teach, but also to, to learn also. Brilliant. Yeah, great, Chris. All right, listen, Thank mate. you very much. Thanks God bless fun. you.